all seeing the uh, African elephant exhibit. Uh, November 90, the uh, bond measure K passed, providing the zoo with additional funds for capital improvements. As you can imagine, with technology coming, electricians, we are always having to update, upgrade. We're in the hilly, beautiful hills of Oakland Zoo, but that can make things a little bit logistically difficult. So um, it might not sound glamorous to say, oh, I donated you know, 50,000 for a new uh, sewage system. But it is so, so needed. Just everything. Whatever money you give, one dollar, it all goes to a really good cause. 1991, uh, Gibbon Island was dedicated. Uh, we got a pair of white-handed gibbons, um, complete with 40-foot trees. They did destroy their trees, and you'll see now we have poles and platforms um, that are up for uh, Gladys and, and Nico. 92, the 1.5 acre African lion exhibit, Simbapori, opened. Uh, we had a pride of six lions. Um, they have, uh, except for uh, Leonard, um, he is still with us. Uh, we're very, very lucky to have Leonard with us because our animals don't have to worry about predators or eating the correct diets and fantastic medical and zoological care. They often live for many, many years longer than they would in the wild. So we have Leonard. Uh, we do have him separated from the three boys. They are just so much stronger than him. And as you know, with uh, big cats, we would hate for them to overpower him and for something to happen to him. But I'm sure you've seen them sometimes. They'll be one of the, the new boys, nose to nose with Leonard, between the off exhibit and on exhibit. So we rotate the same thing we do with our tigers, our beautiful girls. And obviously, you know the two uh, large viewing decks, the concrete deck. Below that is their night house. And uh, I'll never forget when uh, I was standing one day on top of the concrete deck, and I just walked through this powerful roar. And I was like, oh, I can feel that in my chest. It was just unbelievable. So whenever I'm standing up there, I'm always, this is where they sleep at night. It's just amazing. Um, and then the same year, uh, Flamingo Plaza, which is located at the top of the zoo, uh, was opened. And it's home to our two lesser flamingos and our, uh, sorry, I got the number wrong. I won't say two spoonbills and then our lesser flamingos. Uh, 93, Saimang Island uh, was dedicated. And we signed a contract with the city of Oakland to continue their management of the zoo until 2004. And um, you've got that, that's for the little city of Oakland sign there. The Malayan Sun Bay exhibit was dedicated in 1996. Isn't it a beautiful exhibit for our three female bears? Um, that's that. How am I doing on time? Am I okay? You've got plenty of time for four. Good, good, okay. Uh, December 96 marked the completion of the capital campaign which raised 3.9 million to fund building Maddie's uh, Centre for, for Science and Environmental Education which is where we are in the Zimmer Auditorium upstairs and we will show you this during our training. We have our foyer, we have our docent library, uh, we have a, a designated area just for the docents, we have our animal education room, uh, we have all our offices for all our staff. So this is the building that you will be coming in, checking in, getting your radios, checking in with Lisa, Marty and myself, and then going out into the zoo. Uh, 1998, the African village opened. It's now referred to as the African Savannah. It features 11 animal exhibits. Do you know the area that I'm talking about? Where we have the vervets, uh, we have the hyenas, we have uh, the one food stand, and then you've got the beautiful rondavel with the shaded seating, and then also the zebra, the one section of the zebras. And then you've also got the area with uh, our black throated mon uh, monitor, I know Loretta's favorite, and our pancake tortoises. Uh, so that's the area there. And when we do have events, we, uh, we get uh, musicians that come in, and it's really, you feel like, I feel like I'm back in Africa when I'm there, so that's great. Uh, Maddie Centre, where we are, um, opened in 99, uh, yeah, uh, 17.5,000 square foot, and I've already gone over what there is. And this is known as the lower entrance to the zoo. When you go around, uh, curve up the ramp, you get to the lower cashier. 
So we always talk about the lower cashier and the main cashier, or uh, the education department, lower entrance to the zoo, Flamingo Plaza, main entrance to the zoo. And that comes into play when we have uh, lost children or we just need to know your location out of the zoo. Uh, May uh, two, 2000, our uh, Warthog exhibit opened and it's home to our beautiful Warthogs. We're so fortunate to have all these wonderful Warthogs. Did any of you, when you visiting the zoo at the time when our piglets were born? Our uh, little piglets? Yeah, yeah. So uh, just very, very fortunate to have this lovely family. And the Karibu Village, the main entrance pavilion opened, and that was a whole revamp of the restaurant, which used to be known as the Island Cafe. It's now changed to Tuskers Cafe. So if I say to you, um, oh, meet Lauren at Tuskers Cafe, that's at the main entrance to the zoo at Flamingo Plaza. And then the California Trail Cafe is called the Landon Cafe. I know there are lots of names, you get to know them. Um, it's just good to, to know where you are in the zoo. And um, yeah, we got a new membership booth, an outdoor dining area, and we'll take you around to all those different areas. In uh, 2001, our Tiger expansion uh, uh, went, exhibit underwent an expansion, and we added a new waterfall and rock work over the night house. And I'm going to give you a little inside tip. When the waterfall's running, and it stops, the tiger's know it's time for supper. Oh. So you, you don't need to tell the guests that, but just so you're like, well, I know what's happening now. It's really cool, and they're so smart, they, they know. Um, the night house was enlarged, and a new visitor viewing deck was added. And uh, we now have our, uh, we've got Toriko, our eldest, and then we have our four sisters, Molly, Malou, Gracie, and Ginger. And I can say their names because there are boards up there with their names and their history and where they came from. And it's just a great conservation message. Oh, beautiful girl. Um, in October 2001, our squirrel monkeys, they're next to the chimps and they're uh, in between chimps and our new rainforest updated aviary. Uh, it was complete with naturalistic rockwork, vines and climbing structures. The Children's Zoo, uh, Wayne and Gladys Valley Zoo, it has two entrances. So you have one when you go to the lower entrance and uh, one from the meadow, from the Aldabra Tortoise side. So just always remember when you say, I'm in the Children's Zoo, are you closer to the lower entrance or are you closer to the Aldabra Tortoise, Tortoises or the Rainforest? Um, so we made Wayne and we built this new uh, Wayne Gladys Valley Valley Children's Zoo opened in 2005. And our, I'm trying to think of the number. Does anyone, can anyone help me with attendance when we opened? It went up by some substantial amount and it has never gone down ever since then. So, and I know a lot of parents, especially parents of toddlers, they'll only come to the Children's Zoo because you've got all those interactive, uh, uh, pieces of equipment, you've got the spider web, and then all the, the little bugs that the kids can uh, count that are, uh, have been buried into the concrete, and it's just a really lovely interactive area. Our children's zoo um, is where you'll find our Dara tortoises, our retail lemurs, our blue eyed black lemur, our fruit bats, alligators, rabbits, our guinea hogs, as well as our, we call it the rare room, reptile and amphibian discovery room and the bike house. And the goat and the sheep petting yard is the only place where you can touch animals in the zoo. Or guests can brush animals. Please always make sure they don't touch their heads because I would hate someone to keep coming up to me and touching my head. And they also have a timeout area and then you've seen the rocks with the rubber mats on the rocks. When they need some timeout for people touching them, they know that they can go there and the guests can't go there. Um, just some pictures of our beautiful animals, our uh, bats, our frogs, our alligators, our otters, and the contact job. Um, zoo camp um, is, I always say that um, zoo camp pays the education staff salaries. 
Uh, we, it's a fantastic program. I think it's been in existence, and I'm trying to find the date, for over 20 years. We've just finished nine weeks of Zuka, summer zoo camp. Um, we are prepping now for Thanksgiving camp, and then uh, we have spring camp and winter camp. Um, these programs are sold out. We cater to children pre-K right through high school, and um, kids come and they get their hands dirty. They're outside. They we we go we show them the animals. We take them on behind the scenes. They, we are um, we have to adhere to STEM, the uh, whole program that all the kids use in schools now. So it's just a wonderful program that we're very very proud of. And you'll always see then uh, the zoo camp kids have their colored t-shirts on. We sponsor a different conservation, one of our conservation partners every year. You'll see all these little ones around the zoo. Our Teen Wild Guide program, that's uh, teenagers aged 13 to 17, is run by my colleagues Kay and Tomas. And we have between 150 to 200, depending on the time of year. Um, they, are, they have to complete two shifts a month, either a Saturday or a Sunday, and then during the summer holidays they can come in every single day if they want. And they interpret uh, mainly to zoo guests in um, the children's zoo, and I'm sure you've seen them after the children's zoo. They wear those turquoise colour t-shirts. Yes, Laura? Do you know how old you have to be to do that? 13 to 17. And then I let them go to college, and then they come back and they roll with us and train them. <laughs> so that's what I said to all of them. Yeah. Um, our Zooted Community Program uh, was uh, started in uh, 2006. Uh, we give so much back to the community that supports us. Um, Oakland Zoo launched Zooted Community. The goal was to provide free zoo admission and transportation to qualified schools, daycare, and Head Start programs. Uh, Dan Flynn, my colleague, uh, heads that department. So we do an amazing amount of work with them. Arroyo Viejo Creek, if you um, would like to volunteer, or if people know, if they say, look, I just want to do a one-off volunteer, or I can only volunteer for three hours once a month, they can come and assist our horticulture and ecology staff we have a section of uh, the Royal Viejo Creek that runs through Oakland Zoo, and we are the stewards of that. We pick up uh, debris, we want to make sure that native wildlife that lives in Nolan Park wants to uh, come and breed there and they feel safe to live there. Uh, we plant, uh, we remove non native species, we plant native species. So every third Saturday of the month from 9 to 12, uh, people, if you want to get down and dirty, and uh, it's a great time for a community service or families to come and volunteer, organizations. It's a very popular program. Uh, every third Saturday of the month, 9 to 12, and we meet down at the entrance to the creek, which is as you drive into uh, Gulf Links, the entrance, it's right on your left. So when you drive up today, just look to your right, and you'll see a big board there. This is Arroyo Viejo Creek and my colleague Olivia runs that program. Eucalyptus trees that were moved from that area, uh, we cut down into stumps, and we have made six uh, different outdoor classrooms. So we also do a lot of our programming down at the creek during the lovely summer months. Hmm. And I just love these photos. Uh, <laughs> two of our baby <laughs> have a dress for boots. Uh, 2008, the renovation of the Women's Hut up in the African Village was completed and a reopening ceremony was held. And then 2009, Baboon Cliffs opened. And you know, if you go up the hill, you leave the air department, it's the first exhibit on the left. Um, it's uh, over 8,000 square feet. It includes a cascading waterfall, climbing structures, platforms, and um, they are just a wonderful, happy family with their patriarch leading the troop. The 2010 grand opening of Wild Australia. The only way you can get to see the Wallaroos and the Emus is by catching the train, and that's in the rides area at the top of the zoo. So um, it, as long as visitors, when they come in, they get a stamp, and if they come into the zoo and they want to go to the rides area, they just show up a stamp and they can move in and out. 
Uh, November 2012, uh, the opening of the 17,000 square foot state of the art Bedford hospital, very close to my heart. I've been reading tours of the hospital since it opened, and I should have copywritten this photograph. <laughs> it has been used so many times, I'm so proud of it though. Um, it's just now, go since I think I took you all on your first tour of the Bedford hospital. And um, yeah, there's so many of you, Jane, Jonah, lots of you there. It's just magnificent. We are gold lead certified. Doctor, this is Dr. Parrott's dream for 30 years. Um, our old veterinary hospital, which I'll show you, oh, it's not there yet, um, is now our refurbished biodiversity center and conservation department. But that was something like 11,000 square feet. So we have approximately 650 animals at the zoo from millipedes right up to our elephants. Um, so they can be cared for. And Dr. Parrott has let me know that the facilities and equipment that we have will accommodate our animals' needs for the next 50 years. And I will be taking you on a tour of this magnificent hospital. Um, right now we have, have you heard in the news, we've got Mama Black Bear and her three sons. They have completed quarantine. They are in the hospital waiting for their new exhibit to be opened. So I know that Chain Link is working really hard with Dr. Parrott and the zookeepers to try and get their exhibit safely completed so they can be transferred up there. But guests will only be able to see them when we open in summer 2018, along with all the other animals. Um, Steve and Jackie Kane, wonderful um, members of the zoo. Uh, we have a really close partnership with Ventana and Pinnacles of the Big Sur. I don't know, if, or I'm sure most of you know the plight of the uh, California condor, a beautiful nine foot wingspan. Um, 20 years ago, they were down to 22 birds. That was it. Um, their numbers are now up to 400. You have about half in the wild, and the rest are in a captive breeding program. We hope to have our own captive breeding program at the zoo when California Trail opens. But they are uh, scavengers. So when a hunter, uh, if they still use lead bullets, when a lead bullet uh, hits an animal, it just splatters everywhere when it, on impact. So the birds will go into that point of where the bullet hits, and the chances are when they're eating that carrion, that dead meat, of then getting lead poisoning, it can be high. So uh, twice a year, they have to be caught up, their blood has to be tested, if they do have lead poisoning, they'll phone Dr. Emanuelson, she's the head of the Bedford Hospital and her team. They've all been trained on how to handle the California condors. It takes them two hours to get to our hospital. They used to go to San Diego Zoo um, or LA Zoo, that, but the traffic could be five, six hours. Time is always of the essence. Um, they get them to us in two hours, and Steve and Jackie funded um, the center, which is actually near our elephants, but off exhibit, is not open to the public because if you're going through a process called chelation therapy, where they're trying to uh, draw the lead out of you, uh, you don't want people walking at you and they're, they're going, undergoing rehab. So they first go to the hospital with their x-ray to find out where the lead is located in their bodies. Hopefully, um, Sometimes they can give them some fur and they can regurgitate it if it's kept in their crop. Um, but other times, if it's in their body, then they will have to operate. And then um, they'll keep to the hospital until they're well enough to go into the rehab center. So this was our old veterinary hospital. And I'm also going to be taking you on a tour of the biodiversity center where you've heard about our wonderful work that Margaret and her zookeeper team are doing with um, saving frogs. There are 400 species of frogs that are facing extinction. Frogs are bioindicators. This is Paul's passion. He's going to be speaking to you about it. Um, that's due to the chytrid fungus. And uh, we have just, in the last month, released um, so many frogs. The work that we're doing is absolutely incredible. We'll be able to show you through glass windows because the environment has to be very, very sterile. When Margaret and her team go in there, they have to suit up because we just want to make sure that every precious amphibian survives. And then um, the, the room next door to that is the conservation department. 
And we also have the biodiversity classroom, where we also hold classes sometimes.